Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thanks again for your download. Thanks for being a part of this show. Paul and I absolutely love that each and every one of you listening are learning along with us from our guests, from the different things that we're able to share with you. And today is no different. I, I'm Phil Dark, your host. And today we have Tracy Ham, who her resume would take the whole episode to go through all that. But she is currently the UC Davis women's soccer coach. Go Ags. That is my alma mater. And I am very proud to say that we have a great women's soccer coach there now. She also has a, uh, a thing called the UEFA A license, which very few women in the world have. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. There's been a documentary made about her as well that will point you to and hopefully you'll check that out because it's a pretty pretty great documentary that you can watch she also has a whole bunch of degrees i don't have time to talk about all of them but it's pretty darn impressive when i'm looking at the old resume so anyway without more from me about tracy tracy how are you doing today I'm doing great. I'm in the middle of double days with yeah. the Ags right now. We're loving it. I think we're all so happy to be back on the field finally after a very long time off. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I've, I've actually spent the last week doing preseason disc training with some teams out in Texas. And I, I'm very much glad to be back in California, first of all, where it's not 85% humidity. But it's been a lot of fun seeing the girls pretty antsy to get out on the field, the coaches antsy to get out on the field. So I have a feeling it's a, it's a pretty good feeling to be out there. It has been, been really positive energy so far. So. That's really good. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. So, you know, before we get into, you know, the, the, the kind of the nitty gritty about the, the interview and some of the things that I talked about in the little intro, you know, briefly share your story, just, you know, how you got to be passionate about soccer and leadership and uh, really how you got to be the UC Davis women's coach. Yeah. So I played like every single sport that existed, I think growing up. And I was like a three sport athlete in high school. I think I tried to play five sports and then there's just not enough hours in the day. And also, you know, academics are important. So there was, it was hard to fit everything in, but I just grew up a competitor and sports was definitely something that was a huge part of my life. I'm the middle girl. I've got two brothers and my parents are super competitive from like starting like board games to anything. And it was just a culture in my family to compete and be passionate about doing things the right way. Everything had to be fair. If you cheated in a board game, you were like not allowed to play for like two years. Nice. You know, it was everything had to be fair and you had to show up and put in your part. So it was, yeah, but I think throughout my whole childhood, I just started to compete. And so soccer was my favorite sport. And that was kind of my ticket, I think, you know, into college to playing at the highest level. And I loved it. You know, I loved being on a team. I loved just the the kind of the culture of soccer where you really didn't need a lot of equipment. You could go anywhere and play anywhere. And I really liked that it was kind of the global sport. I grew up in a really small community and I think that soccer, you know, touches every corner of the world. And that was a really special thing to me. So when I got to Cal and played my uh, college career there, I think at that point I fell in love with the team aspect, which sounds interesting because I was 18 and I'd already been playing for, you know, 12 years at that point. But I think when you're younger, you know, you play a little bit selfish and it's kind of like, what can I get for myself out of this game, especially during the recruiting process? And so when I got to, to Cali, I realized that there was players that were a lot better than I was I and mean, that I actually had to really, really work for things. And I really liked the, the women that were very well-rounded and very holistic in their approach to the game. And so after college, uh, the pro league didn't exist yet. And so I played for three years in the WPSL and I started to coach a lot because like most people, when they graduate college, when they're not an athlete anymore, they're lost. And so I was doing like 10 different jobs, trying to figure out what else gave me as much joy and passion as the game did. So I loved coaching and but I coached club. And when the pro league started again in 2009, I got drafted and I played for two seasons and I had three, three pretty serious knee injuries throughout my career. And I also realized in my last pro year that I really loved coaching and I missed that part of it. And I started to think about the game in a very different way. And I didn't have that same like drive and passion as a player as I did for coaching and analyzing the game and seeing it more from an analytical standpoint. So I went to grad school and I got my master's in sports psychology from Boston 
university. I always thought I really had a good grasp on the mental side of the game. And I really wanted to develop that educational piece as well. And I wanted to be a sports psychologist. And then I realized I don't want to do that, <laughs> but I still took kind of the, the tools and the educational piece from that. And I implemented it into my coaching. And so when I was done with my master's, I got my first head coaching job at Santa Rosa junior college, which I knew nothing about junior college soccer, but I knew that it was a full-time position that paid pretty right. well in wine country. So I was not mad about that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think I, it was on par with the level that I was at in terms of my knowledge and awareness, you know, for building, building the right environment and knowing, you know, the level of the game and the demands. And it was wonderful. I had great three years there. And at that point, I didn't know that I was going to be a a head coach, you know, as a profession. At that point, I was 28. I was still kind of young trying to figure out like, what, where's my place in the world and what do I love? And I just had such an incredible experience there, not necessarily from the soccer level, but the, the different demographics and how eclectic of a group it was and that there was women that were going through so many different things and they were in such different pieces and places in their lives and the challenge of getting everybody to play together and then seeing their life trajectories change was just so powerful for me that it really made me want to invest in women and invest in the game in a much more profound and professional way. So then I got hired at San Francisco state where I was the head coach for four years. And again, just, really loved the developmental piece of growing women off of the field as much as showing them how to compete and how to win in a healthy way on the field. And then now here I am, did well there and got got my first division one head coaching job at UC Davis. Yeah, you know, and obviously there's a whole lot more to every story. We'll get into some of the rest of it today. You can also again watch the documentary. It's called Coach. We'll have the link to that on the show notes. And uh, a couple things from that documentary, actually. The first thing is, uh, did you get a concussion when you hit the big wheel into the house? That was one of my favorite scenes in that whole thing. I mean, a lot of really good stuff in there, but honestly, that I think that was my favorite scene when you just like barreling down a hill, just head first into the just, into the house. That you was know, amazing. I know, and of course, my dad. You know, the audio is just laughing. Yeah, which I'm like. God, good parenting, good For great sure. parenting, dad. But that was kind of what we were taught is just. You know, I don't think I got a concussion, but I definitely stunned myself, you know, and I think that my whole life I've just been very fearless in a lot of ways. Yeah. And it started when at a very young age where test the boundaries, see how far you can go. And if there's a wall in your way, there might be a wall in your way, <laughs> but, you know, back and get up and maybe try again or try a different, different route next time. Yeah, no, it was great. It, it reminded me of my wife Why? filming our kids too, because she would, she would have done the same thing. Just film it and then check if they're okay later. You know, that's kind of the it's kind of the way way it is. Yeah, it was it was pretty fantastic. You gotta check it out, folks. I mean, for no other reason, go watch the documentary for that. It was it was definitely worth the price of admission. But the other thing is, you know, you have as you talk about, you have two brothers. You know, so what did, what did having two brothers? You know, you're you're right in the middle, like you said, right? You're in the middle of the two of them. What would that teach you just really about life and and how did that help shape you into who you are today? I think this is probably one of the most important things. And I, I kind of just came to this realization actually pretty recently was growing up, you know, being, you know, having two brothers, I was never made to feel like I was a girl or like I was the girl. And I think that that, that was really important for me later in life that I never really saw myself as being different or having these societal pressures on me to like be a certain way because my parents raised me as if I was one of the boys like this is what we're doing and my brother my older brother in particular certainly treated me like I was his little brother in every way possible like we you know were in the backyard playing wiffle ball we went and played tag with all the neighborhood kids and we were definitely like pool sharks in a little bit of a way because we would play you know baseball or basketball all the time and no one wanted to pick the girl you know mm -hmm. ever and he'd be like okay yeah and like I'd get picked last but my brother and I both knew that I was going to be like the best player out right. of everybody all the boys so he was like whatever yeah don't pick my sister she's terrible yeah, you know right. and then we would just dominate so it was yeah. definitely fun in that way my little brother is like special needs a little bit he's he had a little bit of brain damage when he was born mm. and so he is i've learned a lot of patience from him and just growing up 
being a big caretaker of his. I mean, he's super high functioning and, and great, but he was a little slow. And it was interesting because my brother, my older brother and I were just go, go, go all the time. You know, a little bit of disregard for what was around us. But I think having my little brother definitely made us both have great perspective. And we're, we're big caretakers at the same time of being ultra competitive, you know, and making sure that he was included in everything all the time and never felt different than us. So it was, uh, it was definitely a special childhood for sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. And as I see the whiteboard up there, I got to ask the other question that I was wondering in, in the documentary that the, I think one of the co- coach she coached with or coach she played for, mm-hmm. it, it was a cow. So it's a, you played for her. Right. And yes. so, and when you got there, you just moved stuff around on the whiteboard and basically said, no, this person should be here. This person shouldn't be whatever. What the heck were you thinking? <laughs> I hadn't even, you know, the best part is I hadn't even committed yet. Like this, I was just a recruit on my visit and I walked in and I was like, I, yeah, I'd played with a bunch of the girls that were on their recruiting board and God, it's like, you look back and I'm like, I can't believe that I did that. Like if there was a girl that came into my office now and did that, I would have been like, who does she think that she is, you know? And so I'm like horrified that I did that. But at the same time, I knew what was going to take for us to win and be great. And I knew that their attitudes were not something that I wanted on my team. And I wanted to go to Cal. I knew I wanted to go there, but I knew that I didn't want them as part of my, my program. And I was 17 years old making that decision. So I don't, you know, like I apologize. Like every time I see my coaches still, I'm like, I am so sorry that that was me. And they were like, you weren't even on the team yet. And then it was like, they're like, you grew out of it. By the time you got here, you were humbled by the seniors. And they, I'm, I'm assuming now as a coach, that they probably had that conversation with the seniors and the juniors. They're like, this girl's going to come in and she's going to try to walk the walk, put her in her place. And they did. I mean, they came at me the first week. So it was good. It was good. <laughs> but that's all right because you you knew you could take a big wheel through a wall. So it didn't really matter. You were, you were exactly okay. Exactly right. <laughs> So exactly right. Okay. So we'll, we're going to shift gears a little bit. That, you know, that, those are some little fun things from the great documentary that I saw that I just had to ask or I, I would have, I would have felt like I didn't, I missed the opportunity, but now let's go get a little bit more serious. So what is, not that that was, I mean, that, that's actually some really cool lessons people can learn from all of that we just talked about, but what is your personal why and really your life purpose and, and how has that played out in your coaching at UC Davis and really elsewhere over the years as you got your UFAA and other things? Mm-hmm. I think that it's shifted, right? And saying as you mature, your perspective on the world changes quite a bit and where you see yourself in it. I think my my why has now become really about empowering women to be great and to realize their potential. And I, I think something that I, you know, just me personally, but also as a woman is now I've started to recognize that you're such a product of the people that you surround yourself with. And that when people are better than you at something, it is, those are the people that you want to latch onto. Those aren't the people that you want to shy away from or be scared of or intimidated or be jealous of ultimately. And I think that that's something that women struggle with quite a bit. And I don't know if it's an insecurity or, you know, a lack of confidence, that fear of like failing or not being good enough is something that when you find, you know, women or men or anyone that are successful ask questions, like find a way to get in their circle. Don't shy away from it because you're only, you only get better by surrounding yourself with people better than you. And that's a hard thing to understand for a lot of people, but it's something I'm really lucky that I realized early on that I was super motivated by maybe at the time, my perspective was I'm motivated by not being the best. Now I'm just motivated by other people being great, you know, and how can I carve out my own place in this while adding as much value to a situation as I can without these comparisons or, you know, feeling inadequate. It's just about, I want to be great too. And I need to know how you're great. And I want to support you in those endeavors. And I, my, my why is to bring other, you know, people with me now. It's not to separate myself. It's to, Hey, I know what I'm doing in some of these areas. And I want to help you be great. Cause I see a lot of potential in you and you're bringing other people with you. So my why is definitely shifted and I just, yeah, I really want to empower people to be great. Yeah. And on that note, you know, we talk a lot about mentorship on this, on this show and just mentors and the power of a coach in the life of players. And you know, how have you seen that? Like just as far as for you, 
the importance of you having mentors and mentoring others, but then also the importance of other coaches and players themselves really seeing themselves as mentors and as leaders of others, even when they don't necessarily know that they're mentoring and leading others, especially at the higher levels, whether it's pro or college or, or national team, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I think honestly, the, the, it's really hard. The, I would say not the older that you get, but I guess the higher level, like you said, the more that you move up and the bigger numbers of people that you have to influence increases because, you know, if I, as a, as a college coach, right, there's 31 players on my roster and it's very difficult to build really profound relationships with each player because the nature of competition and the people that are on the field, the most you're coaching the most. I mean, that's just the nature of it, but you can always role model and influence everybody around you. And I think for me, my perspective is always, you know, I might, we might not be tight with every player, but I certainly want them to at least have a visual or a consistency in my demeanor and my approach and my communication that is still influencing them, whether or not they're getting direct one-on-one -on -one contact with me. And I think that that mentorship piece is, I mean, it's, it's honestly everything. Cause if you can't see it, it's really hard to imagine yourself in those situations or have a visual representation of, okay, this is how she handled this. Um, especially for, you know, my staff, like I want them to all get head coaching jobs also. And I have to model the appropriate response and behavior and we don't get it right every time. But I think showing the consistency is super important. But, you know, I had really great mentors, whether or not they knew it at the time. You know, I'm someone that I think shied away from asking questions when I was, you know, early on in my career, because I didn't want it to appear that I didn't know something. I felt like I had to know. And now, you know, these like women that I talk to, they're like, can you stop calling me? Probably because <laughs> I, like, I asked so many questions. I um, want to know how things are done. And the more perspective or difference in opinion that you can find, the easier it is for you to weigh both sides of something and create the best thing that feels very authentic to you. Yeah, I think that's so important what you said there, just as far as, you know, to really be able to ask the questions and mm -hmm. to say, I don't know. And I talk about that all the time. I don't know is such a great answer. If you don't know, if, if you then go and find the answer, if you then go and, and research, if you then go and ask the right questions to the people who might know it as a coach to show the humility to say, I don't know. And, you know, hey, but let's figure it out together, right? Like that's something that I think you gain so much respect from people. Some people, like you said, you, you didn't want to seem weak. You don't want to seem stupid. You don't want to seem whatever. Fact of the matter is when you say, when you try to fake it and then people figure out later, that's way worse than saying, I don't know. So, all right. So the, the vulnerability piece is really, really key. Yeah. Absolutely. It's huge. I mean, obviously, Brene Brown has, has brought it to the fore over the last several years, but it's, it's been a thing that's been around for a little bit longer than, than her TED Talk. But it's absolutely something that is, is critical to leadership. If you're not vulnerable, you're not going to be able to, to lead to the, to the fullest extent of leadership. So you've also said, I've, I've, you know, in some different interviews you've done, whether it's on the documentary or in other interviews, I've heard you say that you're a big culture builder. You've also said uh, your favorite quote is how you do anything is how you do everything. And really, I think that those two quotes work together quite well, especially in the context of healthy cultures and why a healthy culture is so important to a team and how we can develop those healthy cultures. So can you just talk about those quotes, how they do work together? I mean, if you, do, if you agree with that and how you build that healthy culture or seek to build that healthy culture in your teams. They definitely fit together. I think when I'm looking at building my culture, it always starts with integrity. What I mean by how you do anything is how you do everything. And I am someone, and I think the more you get to know me, this will be more obvious. I don't really like rules, but I do have standards and expectations. And that's the way that I approach everything because I think every situation is different. So when you put rules on things, there that usually means that there has to be some sort of repercussion. And I just don't live my life like that. I don't operate like that. And I don't really think that teams necessarily need to have very specific rules for most things. I think that if you just have the right standards and expectations, have integrity, be respectful of each other. Those are the, the value system is really what is 
creates those rules, right? And those ideals and those standards. And then if there's something that happens outside of that value system, well, then it's a different conversation, right? Then there's, you know, maybe rules that have to be implemented or different tough conversations that have to happen. But I, I think the way that I build my culture is really by building an important value system that everybody is bought in on. And some, you know, there, you know, there's a lot of kind of you know, words that everybody uses, like accountability is one of our values or, or commitment. And they, they don't necessarily have to be profound, but what does have to be profound about it is that you are constantly and consistently implementing those values over and over again. You're not, you know, ever shifting away and everything that happens in your program or on your team, uh, you're using your value system to make decisions. So it is a, it's a priority. It's a way to keep things in line. It's a way to keep your standards and expectations at the highest possible level. But for me, the way that I lead everything is really just with integrity. And I, I really pride myself on just doing what I say I'm going to do, having follow through and really being, being me all the time, right? I'm not a different person necessarily off the field as I am you know, on, uh, there's different versions. Like obviously when I'm competing, I'm incredibly <laughs> intense, but I wouldn't say that like off the field, there's not moments where I'm not intense also. Right. Yeah. I just try to be very authentic and genuine all the time. Cause at the very least, you know, anyone that's around me knows what they're going to get. They don't ever have to like walk on eggshells or be like, I'm not, uh, what kind of mood is she going to be in today? I just, I'm me all the time, you know, and they're, they know through my consistency, my players and my staff, like what's going to bother me, you know? And it's yeah. not one thing one day. It's like, listen, this is what our expectation is. You need to come in. You need to have a good attitude. You need to work hard. If you're not doing those things, well, then we have to have a conversation, but like, that's the expectation on the flip side of that. Like I said, the, how you do anything is how you do everything is I hold myself to those same standards. I'm not asking, I will never ask anybody to do something that I don't do myself. I don't think there's anything more irritating to watch other leaders do. I, it's just, you, you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. Otherwise, you know, your validation is out the window in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I fully agree with all that, you know, and I also know the importance of culture in every team, whether soccer team, organization, family, I mean, whatever, right? Like if the culture is unhealthy, it affects everything. And I know you've said that same thing. Why is that? And what does that look like? Have you, I mean, have you, do you have an example of a team you've been on or teams you've seen that, that their culture is toxic and how that has affected thing versus a, t a culture that's healthy and how that has affected everything? Sure. You know, I've taken over three programs now at this point, so I won't speak to which one I'm talking about, but you know, there's definitely a healthy way to compete. And I think when you don't have a healthy level or understanding of what it means to compete with the purpose of making each other better versus the, you know, com competing to make each other worse. And it, that to me is one of the most toxic things because especially obviously in, in a sport environment, like you have to compete. That's, it's part of, this is a competition, right? It's a game. And so if you don't have that piece, then it affects everything. Cause then, you know, the, the relationships that you're trying to build on the field end up, you know, being pretty toxic off the field because competing and going to tackles hard becomes something bigger than it needs to be. It's not just about the game. It's like, well, so-and-so doesn't like me. So she's trying harder against me. And you have all these different, I mean, I have a lot of examples of, of what it can look like, but mm -hmm. ultimately when you don't have a good culture, it just takes the joy out of things, right? Like I, I just remember sometimes showing up to this, this one program when I took over and it was I just, it was like, there was the joy had been sucked dry in a lot of ways from the players. And I just, I felt bad, you know? And so my entire purpose that season was just to make, and this is a little bit outside of who I am, you know, talking about being authentic all the time was just to be really positive and try to make it fun again. And then within that, try to teach them how to compete in a fun way. Mm -hmm. And that competing is fun. Competing isn't painful. It's not something that needs to be, you know, like a, a negative, right? That's what makes us fun. That's why we're here. We love competing. That's why that's we're right. playing at this level. No, absolutely. No, totally. That That's something that, you know, like you said, competing is fun. And we, we got to figure out how to make it fun, especially for certain personality styles. If you don't make it fun, they're going to bail pretty quick. And then other people will not like the conflict. And, and so they'll just be out and running for the hills. So 
we need to understand all that, and which is which is why it's so critical to have that healthy culture. And and again, we've all seen it with different teams to know you come in and how can we get that back? And some people are more aware of it than others. All right, so let's shift gears now to talk a little bit about the the documentary. Coach again is what it's called, and and you know, first of all. It, the fact of the matter is, here's just the stats on it, I, and I saw this, and I'm assuming the stats that popped up during the documentary are actually accurate, at least as of the making of the film, but only about 1% of nearly the 44,000 coaches with the UEFA A license are women, and that is the highest license you can get in UEFA. Is that, That's correct, right? All that is is, is correct? You can, there's, a, there's a pro license now. Okay, um, okay which takes a few years and you have to be coaching professionally in Europe in order okay. to get it. Yeah. So for an American coaching in America, yes. that's, that's what you can do. Correct. So, you know, that's, that, that in and of itself is pretty cool. I mean, does that like ever get old to like, think about the, the fact that you were able to, to do something that not, and it's, it's not something like, Oh, you're so much better than everybody else. But the fact that you were able to accomplish that, that I mean, it's got to feel pretty good. <sighs> it, it does. And, you know, I've, I've seen the documentary, obviously, many, many times at this point. And there's mm-hmm. a couple, you know, moments where I get, like, tearful in the mm-hmm. – but, the like, when I rewatch it, I don't necessarily get tearful at those moments because, you know, it just – I've seen it enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the one thing that does make me tear up is actually when they put that stat, mm-hmm. when that flashes on the board because, yeah, I think it's a really proud moment for me because it's still so shocking – that how small the numbers is and yeah it's an opportunity for me to look and be like I did that and not again like not because I am better but than anybody it's like I just and not that I feel like I survived something but it's more of a feeling like I did something really hard and I came out better for it I came out profoundly better for it and I use that as a you know just like a reminder that we can do hard things we can challenge ourselves and put ourselves in really uncomfortable situations and still still thrive on the other side of it, you know, that it's, it's really hard to be great at anything unless there's something challenging in your way, or unless you, you know, overcome something or yeah, push, push your limits. And so for me, it's a, it's a really good reminder, but I hope that number increases. I've been doing what I can to help other women pursue the license. Cause if I can do it, they can do it. And that's, yeah. that's one of the responsibilities of being the first to do something is you have to pass the torch on and keep it going. Definitely. Definitely is something that I agree with all that you said there. The other thing I know, I, Amanda Cromwell, who've had on the show is a good friend of mine. And she's talked, we've talked a lot about these things too, as I coach different levels and, and I've seen what she talks about and I'm sure you've seen what she talks about with me or has talked about with me, which is when before a game, the referee will come up to the male assistant coach and assume they're the head coach. And you said in the film, there's no man that knows what it's like to be a female player. And I know you're not saying that to say, oh, you know, poor me, woe is me, but just to be aware of the there are these things that are going on that make it difficult, make it more difficult, little barriers that shouldn't be there. I'm assuming that. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that is that kind of what you're talking about there? And then why is it important for us to understand what, you know, what it is like and, and w- how we can be changing these things? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's not even specific to, to soccer or to sport. I think in general, like you just, you don't know what you don't know. You can't know everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what it's like to be a, a black male Mm -hmm. living in America Mm -hmm. Uh, as much as I can read or educate myself or have tough conversations or like learn. I will never know what that feels like or what that's like. I can give perspective and I can think I know, but I don't really ever know. And that's, you know, in, in women's soccer and as a coach and as a player, there's, there's things where I I've, I've had fantastic male coaches. I've I have amazing male allies. I've got amazing male mentors. So it's not a knock to anybody. It's just there's there's only so many conversations and things that you can talk about. But they, at the end of the day, like you still just like don't know, right? And so you have to be open to having conversations and trying to learn as much as you can. And so I, it just the the perspective of thinking that there's an ability to change and grow and being open to it as a male is so important. And so, you know, the fact, and this sounds like, obviously you're well-educated and a huge ally for women in the game, but 
some men would never even be interested in hearing anything that I have to say regard. I could get every single license that existed. I could have every degree that existed, but it's still, I'm still a woman, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, and for me, the, I think the way that I look at it now is I'm like, well, it's just a bummer for you. I think, you know, before I used to think, okay, like I've got to keep fighting and working. Cause I need, I need them to like validate who I am and what I do. But now I just look at it and I'm like, you know, well, that's just too bad for you because you're missing out on right. a huge part of the game or understanding, you know, how to be the best coach you can be and understanding like women and the way that they look at the world and the way that they, the way that we see ourselves in it, you know, all of those things matter when you're trying to get the best out of a player and get them to perform at the highest level. Definitely. I think it's just learning, right? It's that learning posture, whether it's, you know, learning, me learning from females, me learning from other cultures, me learning from different races, different, you know, backgrounds, different, you know, Americans who come from different backgrounds and different rural versus urban, all these different things that we can learn from each other. It makes us, makes life so much richer to Absolutely. understand and to actually be able, you know, I've been fortunate enough to travel the world and, and to see different people in different cultures and share meals in their homes and just really get to dive deep into people Man, it's just, it makes everything better and richer, in my opinion. Now, I, so I, like you said, I mean, when people are kind of like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to learn about that. Well, you know, that's, that's their problem, yeah. right? You know, and if we spend all our time worried about them and trying to get them, we're not going to change some people. But why is it important? Going, going back, you talked about, you had, you've had male coaches, you've had female coaches. You, you obviously are a female coach and different coaching staffs have both men and women on them. I think it's very important for at least, you know, for every staff to have at least one female if you're coaching females for sure. Why is that? What, what are the different things that different gender will bring to the table? You know, whether it's coaching boys, girls, whatever, why is that? Why are those different perspectives important in the context of coaching? Yeah, I think that when you're, you know, navigating your role as a coach, whether you're the head coach or the assistant coach, you know, genders can become really important just from like an approachability standpoint, I think in a lot of ways, you know, we just said that like you, there's no, a man doesn't know what it's like to be a woman. And the, the reverse of that is true also. So, you know, coaching boys, like there's things that they're going to go through that I don't understand and I can't give them feedback for, like I can listen. Right. But my advice might not be the best advice because I don't know. And I think, you know, women, it, it's it's interesting, you know, having watched and studied a lot of female coaches at this point, that there's definitely a level of like overcompensating in some ways that women try to project this, you know, kind of a, appearance and demeanor that they're, they're tough and they're loud mm -hmm. and they're, you know, typically, you know, masculine traits, I guess, or this is who their male coaches were like. So they're trying to, you know, embody and personify some of those things where the more authentic that you can be, the better. But I think that it's hard because women think that they're supposed to be a certain way. And the more comfortable and confident and experienced you get, I think that hopefully that that changes. But having, you know, different genders on staff can be really important. I'm one of I think there's only four or five staffs in the country that are all women. Mine's one of them. So I have three assistant coaches that are all female. And that's not because I really just wanted to have female coaches. It was just women that I knew in the game that I thought were super talented that mm -hmm. could help us win championships. Right. There's obviously a lot of males that I know that would be great too, but I think that a lot of it is that women just need that opportunity to get their foot in the door and they're just as talented if when given the chance and the opportunity to, to grow and to be in the right environment. But yeah, having a, having a balance can be really important, but I think it's really just from your, your overall communication style and demeanor. I think I'm a pretty good balance, I guess, of what you would historically say is, I guess, more more intense and competitive. I don't really like raise my voice much, but you know, I think what you would think would be more of like a male trait. I certainly embody at times, but I'm also very bubbly and fun when I need to be lighthearted and approachable. So Perfect. I try to find that balance because I think it's just good coaching. It's not necessarily specific Absolutely. to a gender. Yeah. And I, I, I actually had that in, in the outline to, to, to kind of discuss but I and I'd be curious to hear if you agree but I think most of it or a lot of it not most but like you said the approachability I think is critical like just the fact that you know female female there's certain things that like you said I'll never understand I just won't get I have I have three girls and a wife in my home and I get that right mm -hmm. but I also believe that a lot of it's a personality thing and not a gender thing the way mm -hmm. we're wired 
Some of us are more approachable than others, depending on who's coming to us. And they, if they get us and we get them and we're the similar personality, sometimes it's easier to connect with them, mm-hmm. right? And they might seem less approachable because of personality. So is that something you agree with and you've seen also in your coaching and your playing? Absolutely. And that's, you know, the benefit of being a head coach and putting your staff together is like, I know my, I know I'm scary. Like I am and I don't <laughs> want to be, but like, I just know that I am like, that's my I'm aware, self-aware right. that there's, there's girls on my team that are scared of me because they're not, they can't match my intensity or, you know, they're worried what I'm looking for. So when you hire your staff, you're looking at what, what personalities are going to complement mine. What's their style. We need to have someone that's going to, you know, coach with humor and, you know, kind of be dry and sarcastic. And then we need someone that's just like joyful, big energy. So I think, you know, for me, it's putting together the right staff, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's humans, right? Like we, we relate to, and we identify with people that we're most comfortable with and to have that, you know, I try on my staff to create a giant spectrum of approachability. There has, there's someone for everybody, you know, and that, that was my goal. And I, you know, my two previous programs, I only had one assistant coach or one paid assistant coach, I should say. And you know, it's harder because there's less people to talk to, right? There's, there's, we're short one person. And the more it's like, for me, like the more, the merrier, the more people that, you know, the, the, the team feels like they can have honest conversations with and get honest feedback from is really valuable and really important. And yeah, it it is, it is actually like invaluable in a lot of ways, but the balance of personalities and you know, like it just, even as coaches, like you find yourself like having conversations with the people that you identify with also it's, mm-hmm. it works in both ways. Absolutely. Definitely. All right. A few more questions to finish up. I mean, we could talk for hours, but we don't have hours to talk cause you got to get to another practice and uh, you know, the listeners probably w- would, would get, would get, they might get bored. I don't know if they would, maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. Cause you're bubbly and you're intense. So, and it's a little scary. I mean, my, my kids have told me that I scare their friends often. So I think we're, we're probably, if I'm guessing we're probably similar personalities. <laughs> so maybe that intensity that they say, you know, especially with my blue eyes, I look in the eye and then they, it freaks people out according to my kids. So anyway, that's a whole different story for a different day, but, but I want to get into it just for a few minutes. This could be a four hour conversation. We don't have four hours. So let's try to do it in four minutes. What are you most excited about relating to soccer in America? And what disappoints you the most about soccer in America? And what, and what do you think we can do about it? Mm, that's a really good question. I think that I am most excited about the women's game becoming more and more popular and having a sustainable professional league. Mm-hmm. That to me, this is our third attempt and it's been good so far. There's a lot of room for growth and potential, but I'm most excited that there is an investment in the game from big corporations, from you know different marketing companies that actually want to grow the game that are investing in it. And also that the male athletes are also wanting the women's game to grow, not just soccer, but like, I think most sports, the WNBA and and all those things. I think what I am most disappointed about is probably how elitist youth soccer has become Mm -hmm. and how expensive and how difficult it is to access high levels without having money. You know, it's like soccer to me is like a game of the people. Like, like I said earlier on, it's a global sport and anyone can play it. And I really am disappointed that it's become only accessible to certain demographics of people in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of exclusion that happens mainly just because of finances, which is just really unfortunate. So I would say that that's probably one of the most, and that this isn't specific just to women's soccer. I think it's actually worse on the boys side. So I I think that that would be something that I'd like to, to change is just the accessibility to every demographic and ethnicity is really important. Totally agree with that. And I imagine you, my, my second biggest disappointment, I imagine you'd agree with, is the fact that everything is specialization so early, as you talked about. You and I are similar in that. Like if, there, if I could have played every sport in the world, and my 10-year-old's the same way, mm-hmm. I would have, and he would. You know, he sees someone playing across. Can I play lacrosse too, Dad? Can I play rugby? Can I do this? Can I do that? I'm like, well, we can't do everything. <laughs> but yes, we can play multiple sports, and you will play multiple sports. And if your coach don't like it, tough, you know, and then we'll exactly. find a different team. So Exactly. I agree. And, okay, what is one thing that you hope that all of your players, will, wherever you've been, will understand and live out when they leave your program? 
So basically, if you if they don't know this when they leave your program, you'll feel that you've kind of failed them. Two things, probably the what we talked about earlier at how you do anything is how you do everything and that you need to live your life with integrity and mm-hmm. show up for people, do what you say you're going to do. Follow through is one of the most important things in the world. And then probably this is like another, I don't know if it's a quote. I feel like it's probably something I read on Instagram, but is a lion doesn't need to roar for you to know it's a lion. Mm. And I think mm-hmm. in the age of everything being about what I have and what you don't have, or the world of filters and, you know, showing the world that you're on vacation or I'm here and I have this and I'm doing that is that none of that matters, right? Like you don't have to talk about what you have or show people what you have. You just have to be who you are. And none of that, none of that stuff matters. You don't need to talk about it. Just, just be who you are, be proud of who you are have integrity. And that that's where you build relationships. That's where you build rapport. That's where you build, um, you know, just, just perspective and confidence and really the, the visibility that you actually want is what people don't know about you in a lot of ways. It's just who the interaction that they get with you. Yeah. The face value. Definitely. Yeah. I, I had conversations with that same 10 year old about that very thing that you, you don't need to tell everyone that you're good. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, let them see that and let them tell other people. And exactly. that's, that's not your job. Your job is to play and to have fun and be a good friend. That's right. Okay. What lessons learned directly from the game of soccer? Just maybe one lesson. Have you used in your life and leadership outside the game? So the example we often use that, that I use with my kids is retaliator gets the red, right? So in our house, when they fight, it's typically the second one that I see, right? So I can make assumptions but that's a good life lesson to learn is if you retaliate, chances are that's what will be seen and that's what will get in trouble. Something like that that you've learned that you use in your life outside the game. Oh, man. I would say, and again, I'm not, this is not my quote, but you know, that, that pressure is a privilege. And for me, that translates off the field in a major way because we've all played games where when you win by six, it's fun, but it's not satisfying. It's kind of unsatisfying, right? Like you like the games that are one zero in the 90th minute or two, one in overtime. Mm -hmm. You like the challenge. Like we love the pressure and being in an environment, um, where you're under pressure to perform. That's a privilege because that means that it is value to you. It means that it's important. And so if you look at translate that to like off the field, if you're doing stuff, that's not really that important to you, or you're in relationships with people that aren't important to you, it's very unsatisfying, you know, and to be committed and being invested in something that you find value in is such a privilege because people search their whole lives for that and they can't find it. So pressure is a privilege and winning big games is the most fun, you know? Definitely. All right. Last question. This is always bittersweet feeling for me. I hope it is for my guests too. What, what is, what are one or two things that you've read, listened to, or watched that have most impacted your thinking on how soccer does explain life and leadership? Wow. I would say that, I don't know, this isn't necessarily soccer specific, but I think the book that made the biggest impact on me as a soccer coach was probably Angela Duckworth's Grit. Mm-hmm. I think that that book, I, it just spoke to me and it put words on paper to feelings that I've always had. And it gave me a really good a kind of framework to talk about leadership with my team because everything comes from, especially in sport, through perseverance and resilience and response to failure and long-term goals yeah. and being able to see things through, even if there's not an immediate result. And that, gosh, to me, that's soccer, right? Uh, soccer is one of the hardest things because we don't have timeouts. There's nothing, there's no dead balls. Like you, it's 90 minutes, you know, and you have to problem solve through the entire 90 minutes to, to get things done and to get the result that you want. And so it's a, it's a long-term game. It's not short-term. So grit for me, that book is fantastic. Angela Duckworth is a genius in my opinion. Let's see soccer specific. Gosh, you know, I really like the Man City on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. I just, I think Pep Guardiola is incredible and I love his leadership style. I think one of my favorite things that he said, you know, we were talking about vulnerability is he's like, I don't want them to know that I don't know the answer. And I'm like, (laughs) I love that. He's like, I'll never let them know that I don't know. But he finds a way to like kind of get out of a conversation 
to find the answer and then give them the right one. But yeah. it just, you know, I, I think his ability to manage big personalities and a lot of money and a lot of demands and stress is really, really powerful. And ultimately my takeaway from that as a leader in the game is he's so invested in his players as people and he wants them to have success. It's not just about winning for him, but that's why he's had so much success is he's so invested in them as people and getting them to be great that that's, you know, made a major impact on, on his, on his record. I love that too. As a, not quite lifelong, but pretty much lifelong Manchester United fan. It's always tough for me to say that I like that as much as I do, but it's a pretty brilliant documentary, as is the one on Leeds, which is which is another amazing one. So, all right. Well, Tracy, thank you so much. In the little I've gotten to know you, I've come to respect you quite a lot. So thank you for what you're doing and keep it up. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> a good little breakup in my day. So yeah. I'll take well, it. I'm glad I could be of service. Yes. So, uh, folks, thanks again for your download. Thanks for being a part of this conversation that we get to have every week on How Soccer Explains Leadership. I look forward to connecting with you, whether it's on Facebook, on our Facebook. If it, you also can connect with me, Phil, at HowSoccerExplainsLeadership.com. If you have any questions about the different things we're talking about on the show or the DISC training that I'm able to do, the Warrior Way program that Paul and, Tra Paul and Tracy, Paul and Marcy just jobs in. Tracy hasn't started working with them yet. Paul and Marcy are doing out in Waco. If you have any questions about any of that, feel free to drop me an email, phil at howsoccerexplainsleadership.com. Thanks a lot, folks. And as always, I hope that what you're taking from this show, you're using it to help you be a better leader. You're using it to help you in your every area of your life. And you're also using it to help you understand how soccer really does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great week.